We're here today to talk about a bird that is the favorite of many people, and that's the hummingbird. There are about 325 species of hummingbirds in the world, but they occur only in North America, Central America, and South America. There are about 17 species that live in the United States, most of those on the West Coast. Here on the East Coast, we only have one species predominantly, and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird. They are the smallest bird in the world, and it's also the smallest warm-blooded animal on the planet. They're an incredible little bird. They weigh about uh, a tenth of an ounce is what a ruby-throated hummingbird weighs. So, for example, if you were to take a first-class envelope and a letter that weighs an ounce, you could fit almost ten of them on there and it would weigh the same, same amount. Their hearts heart beats about 1260 times per minute and that's 21 times per second and you can compare that to a human heartbeat which would be an average of about 72 beats per minute they are capable at night during cold weather and, and times when they don't have a lot of food of actually dropping their respiration rate to about 50 times per minute and also uh, decreasing their temperature from a normal of 104 to 111 to about uh, 50 degrees. Their wings beat 78 times per second during normal activity. And sometimes uh, when they're doing the diving displays over 200 times per second. They are capable, the only bird is capable of flying forward, backwards, upside down, sideways. And it's because of the way that their wings are devised, they, the joint which would be similar to our elbow joint, is actually fused. Whereas most birds flap their wings up and down, hummingbird wings fly in a figure eight motion, and that allows them to make all of the erratic movements that they're capable of doing. Because of that, their pectoral muscle, which is the muscle that controls the action of the wings, makes up about 25% of their body weight. Of course, all this activity comes at a cost. They must eat about one and a half times their weight daily in food, and that would be in nectar and in insects. To put that on, uh, the, to compare that to humans, an uh, uh, average man would have to eat about 20,000 calories a day to uh, be equivalent to what a hummingbird eats. They're a very smart bird. Their brain is about the size of a pea but that's compar comparatively larger than any other bird species. And for a small bird, they can live quite long, up to 12 years, although three to five years is probably the average lifespan of most hummingbirds. As you probably know, hummingbirds do migrate. They're here during the summer, but they're not here during the winter. And that migration is triggered by changing day length. For example, in the fall, when they migrate, as the days get shorter, that causes them to uh, think about migrating and they go to Central and South America during the winter time. Usually about the beginning of September most of the males will leave first on the first full moon in September and uh, they do migrate at night so we think this probably helps them to uh, navigate as they're moving moving south. They will congregate on the Gulf Shore area around Alabama, Louisiana, Texas and then they fly, many of them, directly across the Gulf of Mexico, 500 miles to Central America. They, they leave at night, and by the next evening, they are there. So in less than 24 hours, they make that flight. Some of the birds also follow the, uh, the coast around Texas and into Mexico, but most of them fly directly across the Gulf of Mexico. They can fly as high as 10,000 feet in elevation, but often they uh, migrate much lower. And uh, they don't fly in, in large groups, uh, it might be small groups or individuals. And uh, this protects them so that in the event that a hurricane or bad weather would come into the Gulf of Mexico while they're flying across, uh, we don't lose all of the birds. In the springtime, the birds migrate back to the United States and they congregate in the Yucatan Peninsula usually in late February and early March and then again they fly 500 miles across the Gulf of Mexico to land on the mainland of the United States. In our area 
For the last 12 years, the average date of the arrival of the first hummingbird has been about March 21st, but that varies anywhere from March 13th to March 28th. So right in that period is when we see the first hummingbird arriving, and it's always the males that arrive first. Uh, they leave first in the fall, they arrive first in the springtime. They uh, will stop at, in your yard. Often uh, it's birds that have been there previously. Uh, for example, if you have a hummingbird feeder hanging at a particular spot and you don't get it up soon enough and the hummingbirds arrive, oftentimes they'll, they'll uh, look right at the spot where the hummingbird feeder was and they will go ahead and, uh, and look for it until you put, put uh, some nectar out for them. Uh, they will begin to breed here in late March in early April and they will continue to breed through August. As you probably know, uh, most hummingbirds feed, well actually all hummingbirds feed on nectar from plants. Uh, any, t any type of flower, uh, there's nectar in there that the hummingbirds can feed on. And uh, their beak is approximately this long. Their tongue is also about the same length, so a hummingbird is able to actually reach into a flower or into a feeder uh, for quite a long distance. And what they do is when they're drinking, the tongue goes in and out about 13 times per second, and there's a groove in the tongue, and by capillary action, the nectar actually flows up the tongue and into the bird's mouth. And if you've watched a bird feeding sometimes, you'll see that tongue go in and out many times, and then you'll see the bird swallow after it has a mouthful of nectar. So nectar is very, very important to the hummingbirds for energy. That's what gives them all the energy to, uh, to do all the things they do during the day. But what a lot of people don't realize is that they also eat a lot of insects, and they are very important. Uh, that gives them the protein, the minerals, and the vitamins that they need to survive and to uh, successfully breed. As I said earlier, the males arrive first in the spring and they will set up a territory uh, hoping that the female will like that territory, but when she arrives, uh, she'll usually set up a different territory in an area where there's lots of food and water and is a good place for them to, to nest. The female does all the nest building by herself. And here are some hummingbird nests. This one right here is a fairly new one now you can see the green lichens on that one and this one right here on the other side is an older one that has turned sort of brown but the nest is usually built on a horizontal limb uh, anywhere from 10 to 40 feet above the ground it is made up of plant down covered with spider silk and then covered on the outside with lichens so it's actually a fairly flexible nest. And uh, this particular nest I found uh, about 10 feet above the ground over someone's driveway. And this particular one actually was not used during the entire season. Uh, you can see how small the opening is. When the, after the nest has been used, the opening gets quite large because the spider silk and the plant down stretches. and. Uh, you have uh, two babies sitting in there that are stretching out the nest. The female will lay two eggs. They're about a half an inch long. And uh, she'll begin incubating after the first egg is laid. And then she'll continue to incubate after the second egg is laid. So because the eggs are maybe laid and incubated a couple days apart, uh, one, young might be, one uh, young bird might be larger than the other bird takes about 11 to 14 days for the female to sit on the eggs to incubate them until they hatch out. The eggs are about the size of a tic-tac, uh, very, very small. Once they hatch out, the female will continue to feed them uh, a mixture of uh, ground up or digested insects and nectar, and she'll feed them in, in, from anywhere from oh, 12 to 20 days in the nest and then they will go ahead and leave. And by the time they leave the nest, they're actually larger than the female because she's been working real hard to feed them and uh, she actually loses weight, whereas the babies are just sitting in the nest uh, taking in all the food that she provides for them. They will occasionally uh, nest two times in a summer. Uh, sometimes they will actually build a second nest on top of the first nest, but many times they will go ahead and, uh, and build a new nest somewhere else.
less than one half of the nests are successful and survival of those birds that are successful is only about 20 percent so uh, a lot of birds are lost the best way to attract hummingbirds to your yard is well there's two things one is to put out plants that hummingbirds like which is really any plant that has a flower and you can uh, talk with the folks here at Cold Creek Nurseries. Uh, we have a list of plants that are favorites of hummingbirds and they can provide you with that list and also the plants that you would wanna put out. But artificially feeding them is also a great way to attract them, to get them close to your house, close to your window. Uh, it's just, just a, a lot of fun to do that. If you go ahead and mix your own nectar, you wanna make sure that it's four parts water to one part sugar and don't vary from that. Uh, that pretty much is similar to the nectar, the ma chemical makeup of nectar that's in plants. So stick with that four water to one sugar ratio throughout the season. Just use regular granulated sugar. Uh, you might wanna heat the water a little bit, put it in the microwave, heat it, helps the sugar to dissolve. And, uh, and that's the best thing that you can go ahead and feed them. If you don't wanna make your own nectar, we also sell pre-made nectar. It's all that's ready to go and you can just dump it into your feeder. Or we also sell a powder that you just mix with water and go ahead and put in your feeder. One's not any better than the other. It just depends on uh, how you want to, want to do it. So that's very important. Uh, to make it a four to one ratio. The other thing that's important is when uh, temperatures are 80 degrees or higher, which is most of the summer, you wanna make sure that you change the nectar every three days. Uh, it will turn sour, uh, it can grow bacteria, uh, could harm the birds or the birds will quit using it. So make sure when it's 80 degrees or warmer every three days, Early in the season, you might be able to go five or six days when the temperatures are cooler. But that's probably the most important part of feeding hummingbirds. Now there are many, many feeders on the market as you can see here. Uh, they all work. It just depends on what kind of type of feeder you want. Some are obviously e easier to clean than others. Uh, but the hummingbirds really don't care if you keep a clean feeder with fresh nectar in, they will come to use it. It is important that you clean your feeders, keep them clean. This is just one particular one. See how easy this one is to open. It has a wide mouth, which is easy to, to fill. And the entire bottom comes apart so that you can actually clean everything very, very well. And that is important. Uh, every time you change the nectar, you want to go ahead and clean the feeder. Uh, you can just use soap and water. If it's really, really dirty, you could go ahead and uh, use a little bit of Clorox. Just make sure that you clean the feeder very well after it's finished. One of my favorite feeders is this style. It's sort of flat and it's real easy to clean it. The top just pops off. It has a built-in ant moat. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It's real easy to clean, real easy for the birds to get their beak down in there. And just remember what we said about the tongue being long and the beak being long. So even if there's just a little bit of nectar in here, the birds can still reach it. It's not a problem to get down to that level. This particular one has perches on it. They're not necessary, but the birds will use the perches if they're there and it just makes makes them perhaps stay at the feeder a little bit longer so you can watch them or photograph them. We also have some feeders that mount on the windows as you can see here. Here's a, here's a small one right here that just mounts with a suction cup and the hummingbirds will come and feed. And again, notice how long this is with the bird's beak and its tongue, it can reach almost to the back of this tube to get food. Uh, but this is just a very little simple window feeder and they will come right up to your windows. And uh, it's, it's fun to see them up close. Of course, they don't have to be plain looking like some of these. They can be pretty like some of these glass ones and they work well, just like the other feeders, uh, but they are a little prettier. 
and uh, we have a lot of different uh, glass hummingbird feeders that uh, we sell here in the store. I mentioned the uh, problems with ants can be a problem at feeders. Uh, so there's several things you can do. Some of the feeders have the ant trap built right in. This part is filled with water. And when the ants come over here, it's just like a moat. They can't get by. They, they come down the, this part, but they can't get across the moat to get to the nectar. So a lot of them have that built in to fill with water. If it does have it built in, there's several other things you can use. This is a, an ant protector, again, filled with water. And this would hang just like this above the feeder. And that would keep the ants from being able to get in there. If you don't like filling the ant trap with water because it will evaporate and also sometimes the little birds like to drink the water out of that. This is another type of ant guard. This has a natural pyrethrin disc inside and that's a natural repellent. So again, you hang this just like this above the feeder and that will keep the ants from coming down and getting on your feeder. Sometimes people also have problems with bees or wasps, and that's not quite as easy to take care of. There are some feeders that have bee guards on like this. Bees' mouth parts are very short, not like a hummingbird's long tongue, so they're not able to get in there and get the nectar out. And this little cage prevents them from being able to get any nectar. Also, some of the Newer feeders have a little tip here, which is raised, and that again prevents the bees from being able to get nectar out of there. One home remedy is uh, sometimes people will take Vicks Vapo Rub or Avon Skin So Saw, and if you put a little bit of it right here, not on the flower where they feed, but somewhere nearby, sometimes that will keep the ants or the, uh, the bees and the wasps away because they find their food by smell. Hummingbirds find their food by sight. So the, the smell doesn't bother the hummingbirds, but it does bother the bees or the wasps. It's important to keep your feeders clean. We mentioned that earlier about washing them. There are many different brushes available that you can use to clean them, some tiny little brushes. You can see that how small they are to get in some of the little holes. So uh, a good brush is a good thing to have to help clean. Well, that's the basics of feeding the hummingbirds. Uh, it's, it's fun, it's enjoyable. Uh, we have them all summer. It depends on where you live and the habitat around your house. You may have a couple hummingbirds uh, you may have many. Uh, sometimes in my house in the summertime we'll see 30 or 40 at one time. But uh, other places I've lived I've only had two or three. But one thing that the experts do say is that if you count what you think is the number of hummingbirds you have at your house, multiply that by five and that's probably the number of different hummingbirds that are actually using your feeders. So go out there, enjoy the hummingbirds. Uh, it's great fun in the summertime and uh, good luck. Thank you.